Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. It's Thursday, February the 10th, 2022, and this is episode 68 of the workshop podcast and episode 10 in the ongoing preparedness series. And tonight we're going to talk about small engine maintenance and repair, something I could probably talk about for literally 10 hours at a time, but uh, we'll, you know, we'll keep it to the normal average time tonight. <laughs> so first off, we'll get a little of the uh, housekeeping out of the way. So if you're new to this podcast, because it seems to be growing like crazy, just about every episode is getting more views than the episode previous. So if you're new, thanks for dropping by. If you want to know more about who I am, quickest way to do it, toolmantim.co. That's toolmantim.co. You find my social links, you find the newsletter, and find a ton of recommended products, a bunch of different categories over there. So if you're wondering if there's something I've used and have a review or a recommendation on it, check out the shop section. Ton of Amazon links there, anything you pick up, or if you just start your shop in there, supports the channel. Now, number two, uh, question for you. Are you watching or following the Prepper Broadcast Network? Because if you're not, you really should be. Uh, I came across them a few months ago, or <laughs> I say them, but now it's us, and they asked me to become part of it, and I just absolutely love the community over there. And I usually try to highlight something that I've listened to or watched from them this week, and this week, I was just awesome. Prepper's Live on Monday night, I got to be a part of that. It was a roundtable discussion I believe there was a half dozen of us content creators on there, and we all shared kind of our top tips for six main categories in getting started prepping. We ended up going for damn near two hours. It was just a masterclass in beginning prepping. So if you're interested, and there's always something to learn there, I learn stuff, everybody learns stuff. So go back, check out that episode if you're interested for sure. And then number three, got to get this out of the way one more time, I believe. Uh, well, Sunday night will be the last time. But if you haven't signed up for my giveaway yet, go by Toolman Tim and sign up because the draw is live Monday night and on the 14th. And we're giving away a lot of cool prepper gear. Basically, we got a, a Made in America Buy It For Life can opener. We got a Wi-Fi freezer alarm. We got a Lansky knife sharpening kit and a couple of other pieces of gear. So if you haven't signed up yet, we are hitting kind of a cool milestone for entrance into the contest. This has been the biggest one I've put together yet. I love giving away shit, and I hope you get signed up. So we'll leave it at that. Hey, Mertensen family, how are you? Nice to see you. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about small engine maintenance, something that I learned over a lot of years of being, <laughs> I know I always say abject poverty is a great motivator, but the first couple of years Becky and I were married, I learned more about small engine repair and maintenance than I probably have in the last 10 years alone, simply because I had no money to buy anything. And pretty much everything I had either came from the dump, was a hand-me-down, came out of the shop at Home Hardware where I worked. It was something that people are like, ah, it's not worth fixing, just leave it there. So I kind of had to work my way through. So when we talk about small engines, we got a, a few different categories, but we're going to talk about, so uh, small four-stroke engines. First off, we got mowers, tillers, pressure washers, and generators. Now tonight, we're not going to talk about generators because I'm going to have an entire episode. <laughs> I could do an entire friggin' series on generators, but so that, you know, that's the, the four-stroke stuff. Two-stroke, small two-stroke equipment. You get weed whippers, chainsaws, hedge trimmers, and my all-time favorite, backpack blowers. <laughs> and then you got large four-stroke motors. The main one we'll talk about tonight will be uh, ride-on lawnmowers. And then winter equipment. Uh, it kind of had its own category for snow blowers because even though they're similar, they're completely different at the same time, if you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so then the next thing is, if you're new to this or if you're just kind of curious, uh, you might have heard me say, you know, two-stroke and four-stroke motors. And so what are they? What are the differences? Where do we start with them? So, so if you're curious, first off, what a four-stroke engine is, is there's basically means there's four steps to the operation. So the pistons make two full strokes for each rotation of the engine. So as the engine goes around, it gets halfway around, you get one stroke. Uh, halfway around again, you get another stroke. So basically the four steps are the intake valve opens, and the downstroke draw, draws fuel into the, the piston. 
or or the um, the housing for the piston there. The, then the piston goes up and it compresses the fuel. That's step two. Then the spark plug ignites. Have you ever wondered what your spark plug does? That's what what it does. It ignites the fuel in there. It it ignites the compressed fuel. And then on the downstroke, the exhaust valve opens and the gases exit the cylinder. So that is. <laughs> Uh, I hope not to get too scientific, but that is what a four-stroke engine is. So if you've ever heard that, that basically means there's four steps to the combustion process. Now, two-stroke engines, I bet you can figure it out at this point, but it's uh, <laughs> two steps to the combustion process. So basically everything is combined in this. So on the, you know, pistons make one full stroke for every revolution of the engine. So that's why they sound faster, they're higher pitched. We'll talk about that in a minute. But so on the upstroke, the piston goes up, the air fuel mixture gets in and compressed and ignited all on one step. And then on the downstroke of the piston, it's pushed down and all the exhaust is kicked out from there. Pretty simple. So when we're talking about the small little two stroke engines, you know, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of one over the other, right? So, you know, two strokes, number one, they tend to be in handheld gear, you know, weed whippers, uh, chainsaws, that kind of stuff, because they're, they're lighter, which means they're more mobile and easier to carry around for long periods of time, which is kind of cool. Now, the other thing, and some people may not realize this, or, you know, uh, two stroke engines are really good when the engine isn't going to be on the level because the oil which lubricates the engine is mixed into the fuel. So no matter which way you hold it, the oil is going to be there. Whereas with a four stroke push mower, if you go up too much of an incline, the oil ends up going back and part of the engine doesn't get the lubrication, can overheat, can seize up, the whole works. Uh, now, if you need high RPMs, really fast, you know, turnover rate really, really quick, again, two stroke motors. You know, think about the little dirt bikes or um, snow uh, snowmobiles, that kind of stuff. They they sound like a sewing machine on steroids, you know, high pitched, fast whining. And that's because they're going really quick. Two stroke motors tend to have less parts because they're just a simpler design. But because they go faster, harder and hotter, they tend to have a shorter life. Plus the fact that they're dealing with oil mixed in. They're louder, uh, way louder. You tend to really need to wear ear protection when you're working with uh, two stroke motors, as we know anyway. And, uh, you have to mix the gas, right? So we're going to talk about mixed gas later on if you guys haven't done that kind of thing before. So if you're absolutely brand new to small engine, this is going to be small engine maintenance 101. I may even do like a 102 or 201 or whatever the hell we're going to call it down the road because there's so much to cover. This is just going to be kind of the high points of all that. Now, because the oil's mixed in with the gas, you end up getting more pollution, which really kind of sucks. So here's an interesting kind of fact that kind of makes me feel a little bit bad because I use backpack blowers all the time, but running a backpack blower for one hour gives off the same emissions as driving a Toyota Camry for a thousand miles. Something to think about. Anyway, now, not going to be an issue in California because as of 2024, you guys aren't going to be able to buy anything with a small engine on it. You know, I am no fan whatsoever of government mandated anything like that at all, period. End of story. No exceptions. But I will be the first person in line to buy a battery powered backpack blower that will work good enough for me to blow snow here in the great white north of Alberta because less sound, uh, you know. Uh, oh, Ken Struck over on Odyssey says, go electric for leaf blowers. Your ears will thank you. Now, I wish that were an option for me because I I use my backpack leaf blower for uh, 25 to, well, anyway, more than two dozen properties for snow removal. And they work great up here. And like I, when I can get a battery powered that will be powerful enough and have enough of a life and I'll buy 12 batteries if I have to, that'll work in the cold, I'm all about it. Because then I can go and I can blow people's sidewalks and not worry about waking people up too early in the morning. I can just wear regular earbuds instead of the over the earmuff style. So many benefits to it. So when they do, you know, but I would much prefer industry just, um, you know, coming up with it on their own, not being forced by government. Because every time government gets involved, they manage to screw things up. Now, as far as Two stroke motors. I was kind of talking about some used to be able to years ago get a push mower that was two stroke that had the oil 
mixed in with the gas. And uh, I always used to see when I was a kid, we had this uh, uh, 400 year old French fort in Nova Scotia, where I live, where I grew up. And they had, it was designed, there's these great big banks, you know, they're probably 50, 60 feet high and they roll up and down. And it, it was designed for the soldiers to come in, get over the side, get trapped. And then of course, the French soldiers could shoot the English soldiers while they were down in these areas. Anyway, now it's just a uh, place that people go, like a museum. And so they needed a thing. Now they have robot, <laughs> like remote control um, push mowers and that kind of stuff. Well, they're not push, they're remote control. But back in the day, they used to have these two-stroke mowers that they would lower down on ropes and pull back up. And they had to be two-stroke because the hill was such a steep incline that the oil needed to be mixed in with the gas so that the engine was constantly getting lubricated. It was kind of interesting. I always enjoyed that. So, okay. So now we kind of, you know, I always love to get a few facts out of the way and kind of the definitions and that kind of stuff. So if you've ever wondered, that's the difference, two-stroke, four-stroke. You know, what are the benefits? Uh, the four-strokes tend to last a lot longer. They tend to be quieter. They tend to not have as much uh, emissions coming out of the other end of them. The whole works anyway. So when it gets down to troubleshooting an engine, I've got kind of seven steps, seven areas to get started. Some of them are a little more simple than others. And they're kind of areas that, you know, I start with whenever I'm trying to figure out what the hell might be wrong with an engine. And this is something that is absolutely of dead importance to us as preppers and as, you know, repairedness minded people. Because, you know, without our gear, we have to do everything by hand. So the longer we can keep our gear running, the easier it is. You know, if if you have a tree down and you can't, you know, can't get out of your driveway in a hurricane or an emergency, you need your chainsaw. If the maintenance wasn't done or something goes, you know, hellishly wrong on it, you need to be able to fix it so that you can get out there and get working. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm, if your snowblower ain't working, well... Maybe we failed in our repairedness. So anything and everything that we can do to make sure our gear is up and running makes things that much better for being prepared, looking after prevention, and being able to take care of just about anything that happens. So, all right, number one, and this one, please don't shoot me, please. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, here we go. Let's bring that one up. Brian says he must be a two-stroke. Lots of emissions. Yes, uh, I inherited that problem from my father as well. And he has the keychain that says he's the world's largest source of natural gas. So yes, uh, I, I would say I'm probably also a two-stroke because I have lots of emissions and I make a lot of noise. Uh, <laughs> so when we're troubleshooting an engine, here's the first thing, okay? And don't shoot me when I say this, but make sure the fuel shutoff is in the on position. I say this because I've been the dumbass who's been pulling and pulling and pulling on a generator or on a mower before. And then I look down and I realize, well, shit, the shutoff's turned off. It happens to me quite often when I rent the tiller. You'd think I would learn this, but I rent the tiller from my local rental place because they have shutoffs and they do it for tran transportation. But first thing you should always check, and it doesn't matter if you're the last one to use something or not, look down and see if there's a fuel shutoff. And if there is, Make sure it's in the on position. <laughs> anyway, I know that's simple. Now, the next thing is check your oil levels. So again, if it's running hot or say it's not running at all, check your oil level. Because if it's a semi-intelligent kind of item or, you know, especially generators, and I'm not talking about generators tonight, but, you know, a, a lot of gear has a low oil shutoff and that, you know, that's going to prevent catastrophic damage, right? Because if you run out of oil and then you keep trying to run your uh, gear, you're going to have a bad friggin' day. Trust me, been there, done that. And it's pretty rare when something seizes up, and that's what happens when your oil gets too low, that you can fix it without, you know, with it being worth the time to do it and worth the money and parts to do it. So check your oil. If it's low, there could be a chance that your item has a low oil shutoff in it, and it just is, you know, it. It turned itself off. And that's a simple one. Top your oil up. And while you're doing it, do an oil change. Drain out the old oil. Keep going from there. Now, number three, this is a good one. Uh, old gas. So, you know, if no matter how much you want, how much you wish for an engine to start for you, 
If there's old, stinky, skunky, rotten gas in there, there's a good chance that your engine isn't going to start or it might start and then kick out. So first thing, you know, we always talk about using our senses when we're troubleshooting. Open up that gas can or open up the, the, um, the lid, the cover to your gas tank and give it a whiff. You know, don't get high off it. Don't huff the fumes, but give it a whiff and see what it smells like. And if it smells not like regular gas, if it smells old, if it smells skunky, if it smells funky, you know, and uh, trying to explain smells through a podcast is like trying to explain tastes or colors to somebody with their eyes closed, you know, but if it smells off, there's a good chance the gas is bad. So figure out a way to get it out of there. You know, if it's a mower, flip it on its side, dump it into a container. Um, this can be one of the most common problems I've run into. Um, now, if there's just a little tiny bit of old gas in there, you can always just top it up with a lot of fresh gas and then start pulling it to work its way through. Add some sea foam, the stuff I love to call magic in a can, because that shit, <laughs> it's like um, Frank's Red Hot Sauce. You know, I put that shit in everything. And it does like sea foam will get in there and uh, it doesn't revitalize old gas, but what it does do is clean out the old junk that was left behind by the old gas. So get as much out of there as you can. Uh, you can use one of those pull piston pumps, just those manual ones that you just kind of, you know, pull the handle up and suck it out or a turkey baster. I've used everything. Just whatever you do, don't use your wife's good turkey baster and then um, give it back to her afterwards. I didn't do that, but just don't do it. <laughs> so get as much fresh gas as you can in there. Add a little bit of sea foam to blow out all the old junk. Now here's another one. And this one is super simple. And if you haven't done it before, or you haven't changed one before, again, I try to keep these as easy as possible. There's only one step out of the seven that can be a little challenging. So number four is a worn out or fouled up spark plug. So this honestly is probably one of the most common issues I've ever dealt with. And it's spark plugs have got to be some of the cheapest insurance that you can buy. If you have whatever item you have that runs with a spark plug, get yourself three or four of each one and put them on a shelf and label them so you know which one goes where. I always do. I try to buy a case of them. They usually come in packs of five or six or whatever it is. Anyway, I try to buy a full sleeve of them and I just keep them on the shelf because there's nothing worse than having a bad spark plug and not being able to get something to, to uh, light up and get going. So a few tips. Uh, number one, uh, you, a lot of times you're going to go somewhere and they're going to have a different brand uh, of spark plug. That's totally fine. They cross-reference easy. Just take the number in almost every big box store or auto parts place. Just flip through the book that's hanging there. It's usually zip tied to a shelf or something and find yourself the cross-reference number. Number one, that's the first thing. Now, number two, uh, just throw it into Google and find it. So whatever brand the place happens to carry, you can find it and get going with it. Now, uh, I will say uh, there, if you are absolutely dead flat broke, an old thing I used to do was, um, well, two things, but if you have a little gap tool, those are great. They look like a coin with like uh, progressive sizes. So if you find out what the gap is, you can use that to adjust it. I never really worry about the gap, to be honest. I, I know maybe I should, but if you have some really fine emery cloth, like I mean fine, like almost like, uh, I don't know, a thousand grit or 800 grit, you can actually clean the point in your spark plug and extend the life a little bit. It to me, I never had super good luck with it, but if you absolutely have no money or different than that, if you're in a situation where you just can't get to the store and say, I don't know, you put way too much oil in your uh, mixed gas and it fouled up the spark plug and you got to clean it up just to get by, get yourself some emery cloth. That's like, you know, metal sanding paper, get it in there and clean up the, the uh, point part and the little um, arc part on it. Just give them a cleaning inside note, and sometimes that can get you by just enough. Now, the next one, number five, and this is, again, something that Seafoam can work for, but a plugged-up carburetor. Now, this is where we get into things that might be a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Not a big deal. It's definitely doable if you're willing to take your time and learn, but this is something, again, that I had to learn because... We were dead broke 
and I couldn't afford a new mower or a new weed whipper. So I had to learn how to rebuild the carburetor. And that sounds, you know, you're like, oh, Tim, that sounds like you're a mechanic or something. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but okay. So if you've checked everything else and it still acts like it, you know, it wants to run, but it won't run, or it just doesn't seem to be getting the fuel through where it needs to. There's a good chance, especially if you, whatever the item is, has been sitting for a while, that your carburetor is junked up and full of either dirt or nasty kind of glue and varnish from the, from what, you know, all the leftover nasty stuff that gets in gas as it turns old. Okay. So, the carburetor, especially on these small engines, is kind of like a little aluminum cube. Uh, you need to find where it is. It, you just follow your fuel fuel line down, and you'll see where it comes in and it comes out. And your carburetor is what mixes the fuel and the air, and that's you know that's where it gets the proper fuel and air mixture that then goes into the cylinder and the piston and creates you know the energy for the engine. Right. So it's simple. But uh, first off. If, if you're, if it's acting like it's not working really good, there's a good chance that, you know, there's a bunch of little rubber diaphragms, a rubber seal, a spring, and a screen in there. And they're all small parts, but they're not difficult to deal with. So keep yourself some brake clean on hand. I love that shit again. I use it for just about anything. And you want to find where your carburetor is on the engine and you want to get the make off it. There's only two or three companies that make most of those carburetors. So get the make and model off it. And then you want to find yourself, just type in carb kit into Google and find yourself a good carb kit and order it and have one or two of them on hand ahead of time. Okay. Um, and beyond that, this is one of those skills you want to find yourself a couple of really good YouTube videos for and just watch them and be patient and don't strip everything apart all at once when you're ready to go. Take pictures as you go along because all the parts are small and then all the little crevices, once you have the entire thing stripped down, you want to keep flushing it with brake clean until everything just comes clean. And that's basically, I mean, in a pinch, quite often you can reuse those old rubber diaphragms, but they get sticky, they get rotten, and they want to hold into place. So you're better off to just rebuild one of those little carburetors. And you know, if you don't have a carburetor kit on hand, you're never going to be able to rebuild one. So get yourself one or two of those and have them on hand ahead of time and then practice. You know, one good thing I used to love to do was go to the dump, find myself an old mower that looked like it was probably pretty decent, take it home, troubleshoot it and get it running again and then turn around and sell it. And that is the best way to get yourself some experience and being comfortable and doing this kind of stuff. So, you know, find something. And even if you're like, well, you know, it seems to be running okay, but I wouldn't mind it running a little better. Strip the carburetor part, get yourself a carb kit and rebuild it. If you need, um, you know, some help with it, let me know. Um, another way sometimes to test it, or if, if, if you just need to kind of burn the junk out a little bit, get yourself some starting fluid open up the choke so that you can, you'll always see there's a choke there. You want to uh, take the air filter off, look in there, and you'll be able to see there's like a paddle that goes back and forth. So when it's in the open position, it'll be perpendicular. Is that right? Yep. Perpendicular. Here I'm blocking the microphone. Perpendicular to the uh, hole. Spray a bunch of starting fluid in there. Close the, the choke and then pull over the motor. And what you're going to get is a quick bump and it's going to run for a split second because it's pretty much impossible for it to not run off a of starting fluid. And sometimes doing that two, three, four times can be enough to get the engine to blow that junk out and get you by in a pinch. So starting fluid is definitely something good to have on hand. Uh, so from there, this one is so simple again, and it used to be an easier fix than it is nowadays, but a dirty air filter. So if you go around, almost all small engines are going to have an air filter compartment. You're just going to open that up and you're going to check it out. And if it's a foam filter, you're a little bit more lucky than if it's a paper filter. Paper filters are almost impossible to clean. Once they get clogged up, that's pretty much it. So, you know, in a pinch, run it without an air filter. Uh, you don't want to do it forever, especially if you're in dusty, dirty areas, because that shit can get inside and score up the pistons and the cylinder and all that. But if you have a foam filter, Take that thing out, bring it in the kitchen sink, uh, give it a good rinse, put some Dawn dish detergent in it, run it under hot water, and then just scrub it through your fingers. 
and clean it all up, get it really, really good, get it nice and dry, and then put just a tiny, tiny little bit of engine oil into it and work it all the way through and then put it back in. A lot of times that's all it takes to get an, uh, an air filter up and running. So like I said, in a pinch, if it's the pleated kind of paper style air filter, haul that sucker out and try to start it without the air filter. If you do that and it starts, you know that it's a problem with the air filter because that's quite often what ends up happening. It's good to keep a couple extra of those cartridge air filters on hand. I'm going to get into that on our way down here a little bit. But I used to love all the old foam air filters because they were completely reusable and cleanable. That's why they switched to the paper ones. You had to buy more and get more and wear out more, right? So from there, uh, now this one, again, a little more complicated, but a plugged up gas line. I had this happen to my zero turn mower this summer because I ended up getting a whole bunch of junk in a couple of my fuel canisters, dumped it into the zero turn mower. I'm driving along. I get halfway between my house and the property I'm going to mow and the thing drops dead. Stone dead stops working. And what had happened was all that gunk and debris and nastiness that was in the bottom of that uh, jerry can. And quite often this is going to happen when it's at the bottom of the barrel of your gas. It plugged, plugged up the fuel line. And I, so I called my brother-in-law because I was kind of stuck. I'm like, what can I do? He says, just check it out. So I followed the fuel line down to the intake into the carburetor. Uh, there was an inline filter, which was clogged up. I took that out and kind of beat it and shook it and cleaned it up. And then I noticed that the fuel line itself wasn't even running fuel through. So that's a real good sign that you got a clog in there. So I was able to take, again, some brake clean and shove the nozzle up into the, um, into the outtake of the gas, blow it back through, and I was able to kind of dislodge the debris for the evening, get it working. And then when I went back that evening... Took the fuel tank off, give it a good cleaning, put some fresh gas in there, shook it around, dumped it out into my waste oil container, and I was able to clean it up. But quite often, if you're not getting any gas flowing through on the, um, the intake side of a filter, it's a good chance that you got a fuel line clogged up or dirt and debris down in your gas tank. So that is something fairly simple to look for. And a pair of needle nose pliers is usually all you need to pull them stupid little clamps off, haul the fuel line out. And if you've got fuel coming through, you know your problem isn't there. So then put it back in, check on the other side of the fuel filter. And a fuel filter is something to keep on hand as well. we got a list coming up because I know you guys love the lists of all the different things <laughs> to keep on hand just so we can service engines or fix up systems, that kind of stuff. All right. So from there, what? should we have on hand? What kind of gear, right? So if you keep absolutely nothing else on hand at all, keep belts on hand because almost everything else is only going to affect the performance of an engine. So if it's a bad spark plug, it's not going to run as good. You know, if the oil is getting a little burn up, well, you can always run it a little bit longer. But if you don't have belts on hand and you shred a belt, <laughs> and it's getting harder and harder to find a pair of nylons to use for uh, a makeshift belt. But if you don't have a belt, you're hooped. Uh, so, you know, most things have a, an, like a drive belt, and then they have, well, in a mower's case, they're going to have a deck belt, or in a snowblower's case, they're going to have an auger belt. So you're going to have one that comes off the engine that drives the pulleys, and the other one that's going to drive the business end of things. So keep, I honestly... I, I don't always follow this, but a good rule of thumb is to have two of each belt. Uh, have them hanging up somewhere in your shop or in your basement. Keep the numbers clear so you can see them. And when you use the first one, I prefer to replace a belt before it rips and wrecks. So I like to check them. Like my, my snowblower is starting to get a little bit underpowered. So that tells me the belt's starting to get stretched. So I just ordered a new auger belt and a new drive belt today. I'm going to change them both. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the two old belts I'm going to put them in the sleeve of the new belt and I'm going to hang them up somewhere. So now I have a, an old belt for just in case in a pinch if I'm in a bad situation. Plus I have the number on there when I'm ready to order a replacement. So just a good thing to have. Spark plugs, like I said, the cheapest insurance you can have. If you want to make sure that you're able to start your motor good and everything's going to run proper, 
have yourself a box of spark plugs. And like for 10 bucks, you can buy five spark plugs and keep them up on a shelf. And when you get down to one or two, buy yourself another box and label them. You know, I always take and I write on the outside of the box, you know, a weed whipper or a chainsaw or whatever it happens to be. Because, you know, I always tell myself I'm going to remember where the spark plug goes. And I never do. I always think, yeah, I'll know which one that is. I never do. Now, next thing, oil. Keep oil on hand. You know, um, a lot of push mowers just use like an SAE 30 weight oil. So whatever you need for your four stroke motors, make sure you got enough oil on hand to do one or two changes. And of course, oil filters, uh, if, if your mower has them, some do, some don't, but keep enough oil on to do a, a change or two and some filters. Mixing oil. I can never seem to have enough mixing oil. I have gone through more goddamn mixed fuel this winter than I have probably the three winters previous. It just drives me crazy. But have mixing oil on hand because, <laughs> you know, there. if you don't have enough mixing oil and you try to do it, you can end up wrecking a piece of gear. And you're always going to need it when you don't have it. So just make sure you keep some mixing oil on hand. Air filters, like I said, They've switched to them stupid pleated paper filters and not being able to clean them means you need to keep more on hand. So get one or two of those. They're usually cheap. Now, uh, a good rule of thumb is, like I've said, find yourself a good owner's manual with a good parts breakdown and then take those parts numbers and throw them into Google because you're going to be able to find less expensive alternatives than uh, an original equipment manufacturer's part. So find cross-references, that kind of stuff. Amazon, eBay, that kind of stuff. It, Yeah, it was definitely something to have. Take care, Brian. I see Brian's got to take off. Have a good night, buddy. And if you guys haven't, check out the Lots Project. That man is a man on a mission. He does a daily podcast and with some great content. So check out the Lots Project here on YouTube and in your podcatchers, guys. So from there, uh, like I said, air filters, carb kits. Uh, again, man, you can buy carb kits for like... I don't know. It's been a couple of years since I bought any, but on eBay for like six bucks. So buy two or three of those, hang them up on a nail in the shop so you have them because you just never know. It's great to have one curb kit, but what happens if you drop that stupid little screen and you lose it when you're putting it all back together? So just have a set or two and keep them on hand. And here's another one that a lot of people don't always think about. And it's a spark arrester. So you're going to want to look and some people might say, what in the hell is a spark arrester? And if you don't know, that's totally fine. But it's basically a piece of screen in the exhaust, you know, in the tailpipe or exhaust of whatever the item is, that will catch any sparks if they come out of the engine to help, you know, if you're working in a dry area to hopefully make sure you don't start a fire. Now, the problem with that is it also acts as like a carbon catcher. So, you know, all that Sometimes some of that junk that doesn't completely burn or some of the smoke that comes out eventually can clog off that screen. And so what ends up happening is, uh, you know, if you want to have uh, proper you know, suction, airflow, power going through, it needs to come in, it needs to go out. And if you are clogging off the exhaust end of an engine, you're going to starve it of being able to work properly. And if it gets completely clogged off, you may not be able to start it. So take a look. On the end, you're going to see a screen in there. Now, I'm not recommending this, but if your spark arrestor gets really clogged up, you can run a motor without the spark arrestor in there. So take it out and be done with it. But you can also take it out and use a wire brush and clean it up. But you know what? They're cheap. They're like a buck a piece. Buy yourself two or three and keep them in your repairedness maintenance kit. Uh, how about a muffler? You can run it without a muffler, uh, but a lot of gear have those screw on a lot of push mowers anyway have those screw on universal mufflers at least they used to they were a lot but you could buy them at any big box store you can buy them again amazon ebay just type the number into google find it and be done with it but mufflers can tend to well you know they tend to rust out because you know heat and cool heat and cool all the time so if it does just replace one it's not necessarily a proper functioning item but it can be both um a heat issue and more so a noise issue and you know if there's a reason that you might want to be incognito the last thing you want is to have a muffler that's not working and you know rattling the fillings in your neighbor's mouth because you didn't uh you know stock an extra muffler now here's the next one and this one is killer cables and springs nobody ever thinks about it and a lot of times you can 
get by with some aircraft cables, some clamps and that kind of stuff, but sometimes you can't. So if it's a piece of gear that you absolutely can't live without, then get yourself a second set of cables and springs, especially cables. Springs stretch, but you can still tend to use them. You can kind of shorten them, but cables, when they break, they're usually no good, or you need to, you know, tie them back together, repair them, whatever. But, you know, if you, when I got my snowblower brand new, I'd only had it for maybe a week. I ended up snapping one of the cables simply because I was stupid. I pushed it up against something, put too much pressure on it. Boom. So get yourself some extra cables, some extra springs, because without cables, it's damn hard to operate anything. And then again, this is another one. Make sure you get yourself a manual with a parts breakdown on it. And I say that all the time and they're easy to find. Get yourself a PDF. And if you don't want to print the whole manual out, just print out the parts breakdowns because that's where the money is. That's where you're going to find the parts, the different numbers that you need to plug into Google or Amazon ahead of time so that you can have all these parts on hand before the shit hits the fan, literally, figuratively, personally, or across the board. You want to make sure you have parts on hand and you need the information to find them. Seafoam, I talked about that. That is my go-to for cleaning out carburetors, for dealing with old gas. When you're dealing with small engines, that is the cat's ass. Absolutely. Now, here's one. This is probably one of my favorite tips, but I always keep a can of white, a can of red, and a can of black spray paint on hand because pretty much all my gear is going to fall into one of those categories. But anytime you have exposed metal, that's when things are going to rust. And so I try to keep everything covered. Once a year, I go around and spray paint everything. So yeah, okay. So let's say, and I also do this with all my garden tools. So handles, the metal head on them, the whole works. If something gets exposed and it starts rusting, I try to brush the rust off and then I spray over it with whatever color paint is the closest to that. So, you know, and, and I found over the years that white, black, and red all keep uh, are the three that match up the best. Yeah. So, um, let's see here. Yeah. So, uh, Van, Van Drews, uh, Van, Van Drusen, sorry if I got that wrong. I always do that. Anyway, it says I'm late to the chat. I don't know if you said this, but I keep gas dryer and starting fluid on hand as well. I forgot to mention gas dryer, you know, fuel line antifreeze or something that goes in there. Uh, we used to use it in our oil tanks out East for heating oil. Uh, it was methyl hydrate. It basically goes in and attacks the water and eliminates the water. But yes, that's what you need. Some kind of fuel line cleaner, some kind of gas line antifreeze, some kind of gas dryer. I did mention starting fluid, but it never hurts to mention it again. Have starting fluid on hand. And you guys, so there's, you know, there's really three aspects to stocking up for repairedness. The first is parts. Those are fun. I love having extra parts on hand. The second are tools having, you know, putting together a preparedness toolbox. And then the third are products, fluids, whatever it is. And everybody's going to get their, their favorites. You know, dad always swore by WD-40 and I can't stand the stuff. I find it's not very effective, but I have an entire kind of old uh, school uh, shelving unit in my garage that has all of my liquids, fluids, treatments, everything on there. So you're going to find the stuff that you like. And what I like to do is buy a case of the stuff whenever it's on sale. So seafoam, when it comes on half price, buy a case. You know, when mixing oil comes on, I buy a gallon or two, that kind of stuff. So find the fluids, the treatments, the chemicals, the products that you love and stock the heck out of them and have a bunch in your garage. You know, same with gas dryer, same with starting fluid, all of that kind of stuff. And you'll find the brand you like, you'll find the products you like and just keep them, stock them up. <laughs> You never know. You know, it could be good for barter and in a worst case scenario, but more than likely it's going to be better simply because you've got it on hand. And you know what? I would rather have four cans of something on hand and not need it than not have a single can and need it. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, that's my little tangent for the evening. Uh, so then where do we go from here? So we're going to talk about seasonal stuff, uh, you know, putting the gear away for winter and then waking it up in the spring. Uh, so. And, and you know what? If you're like Ted and you live in Florida, you never need to put your gear away for the winter where you consider yourself lucky. But, uh, you know, me and Chris Dixon up here and a whole bunch of other fellers, it's, you know, we got to put shit away in the fall or it's going to do it some damage. But 
So the, here, here's what the process I do when I'm putting away small engines for the winter time. First thing I do is drain out almost all the gas. Now, I got to say, this process has changed because years ago, I used to leave all the gas in it, but treat it with a fuel stabilizer and then more recently seafoam. And I always thought that it was better to keep the carburetor supple. <laughs> what a funny word. Basically keep it wet with gas. But I've since changed my tune by listening to a bunch of other experts who have told me otherwise that it's actually better to run it dry. So what I do is I drain almost all the gas out. Then I add a highly scientific glug or two of seafoam. Then I run the engine dry. So run it completely dry. So that seafoam cleans out any junk that's left in there on its way out. Run it dry until there's not a stitch of fuel left in it because it turns out that old fuel is worse than no fuel whatsoever. Then the next thing I do is haul out the air filter and give it a cleaning if it's dirty. You know, just kind of whatever needs to be done, I give it a cleaning. I don't replace it though. If it needs to be replaced, I usually wait till the spring because sometimes you get mice or bugs or shit in there. Uh, then I disconnect the spark plug so, you know, it's not going to corrode. It's not going to accidentally, not that it's usually going to accidentally start, but um, <laughs> hey, Chris, no problem, man, at all. Uh, okay, so then whatever the gear is, I give it a really good pressure washing top and bottom. Get all the, anything on there that could be, you know, if it's a mower, all that grass, it's going to sit there and get pasty and eat into the underside of the mower. If it's on top, you might have old gas or old oil, that kind of stuff. Get all that shit off there so that it doesn't eat into the metal throughout winter. Then I let it dry absolutely completely. And then I find somewhere to put it that it isn't going to get damaged. Because what ends up happening is if I have a half acid and don't put it all the way away, it ends up being in the way. And then I drop something heavy or push something over on it in the middle of winter. And I wish I hadn't have done it. Because when things are cold and brittle, it's the last thing you want to do is bump them or wreck them, right? So now we made it through the, you know, the awful doldrums of winter. We got through it. The days are getting longer. You're getting excited. You want to get out and start working. And it's time to wake this shit up for the spring. So the first thing I always do is give it a real good inspection for rodent damage. Now, Alberta is officially the only rat-free zone in the entire world. So we don't have rats, but we have everything else. <laughs> Gophers, mice, moles, <laughs> dogs, cats, whatever. Anyway, so I always check it all over. Look look at cables, look at uh, rubber gas hoses, a uh, gas line, because they can rot, but a lot of times they can get chewed. And then you want to check the air filter over because that seems to be a place that little tiny mice like to get in and make themselves at home or little birds get in there and get stuck, whatever. Anyway, so check it all over for rodent damage and give it a good inspection for regular old damage. Because like I said, throughout the winter, you know, that stuff's been put away for six months. You never know if somebody else was in there, knock something over, you know, broke a piece off the carburetor, snapped a cable, whatever it happens to be, and nobody bothered to tell you about it, right? So give it a good inspection for damage. Then at that point, you're going to change the oil. I Because I, I, I tend to leave the old oil in there. I just don't want the new oil sitting all winter. So then, you know, drain the old oil out, put new oil in, and then you've got a nice fresh tank of oil in there. Then the next thing I end up doing is I add a quarter tank of fresh fuel and then, of course, my all-time favorite, a little bit of seafoam, because there can always still be a little bit of shit left in, you know, the bottom of the tank, in the carburetor, wherever it happens to be, right? Let it run for a good solid five minutes until it's blown all the smoke, all the dirt, all the debris out of the exhaust, and you're pretty happy with how it runs. And then, and only then, do you install a brand new spark plug. And I change my spark plugs every single spring. But you might say, well, why didn't you put the new spark plug in in the winter? Well, the reason is, is because, you know, if there's all kinds of nasty junk in that first bit of gas that runs through, it's going to foul up that brand new spark plug that you just installed. So let it run with the old spark plug, get it all out. Then the last thing you do is put a brand new, fresh, shiny spark plug in there. Now, a couple of cool tips or whatever. Don't don't skip out on the spark plug step. My dad and I were trying to rebuild a push mower years ago. And this was when I was pretty fresh and pretty green at this kind of stuff. And now I always say, anytime anybody tells me I got problems starting an engine, I'm like, well, did you replace the spark plug? Well, I didn't. 
And we sat there and we pulled and we pulled and we pulled. And I give myself a nasty case of tennis elbow simply because I didn't go to Canadian Tire and get myself a $2 spark plug and replace it. Because as soon as I did that, I had no problems. Now, here's another little hack or tip. So if you're having a hell of a time pulling something over, like, you know, if you're trying to get it to start and you know you're going to have to pull it 100 or 200 or 300 times and you don't want to do it, you don't want to wear out the, um, you know, starter assembly. So a cool little hack. Normally your, uh, you know, pull cord is typically held on by about four bolts and wherever the the um, the handle retracts into, it's going to be a little bit of a housing. You can normally take the four bolts off. You can haul that right out. And what you're going to see down there is going to be like a cup with a nut in it. And that's basically what turns the entire engine assembly that your pull cord pulls on. Now, what you need to do, and you got to be careful here on a couple of things, but uh, find yourself one of those nut adapters yeah that'll take a well it, it kind of depends but first off you want to find yourself a deep wall socket that's going to fit over that nut that's down there then you want to have yourself an adapter that hit, clicks into that and then goes into a drill or an impact driver then what you want to do is loosely put that on there because if you're not careful you can really wreck your wrist or hurt yourself but you want to put that down there just over top of the nut and then you want to crank it and what that does is it basically gives you an electric start to a pull motor. Now, some people, if they've completely lost all of it, they just start their motor that way all the time. I don't recommend that. But if you're doing, you know, some serious maintenance and you know you're going to need to end up pulling on that 100, 200, 300 times, then you can use yourself an impact driver or a drill or something and crank on it like that but just be careful because if it catches and starts real quick that entire assembly is going to want to spin and you got to lift it up real quick you, you normally hear it chugging along but just you know don't call me and say tim i broke my wrist because i did what you said remember i'm not telling you what to do i'm just telling you what i've done before so just be careful now from there uh one other thing and this is, you know, again, dead simple, but I said this is going to be engine maintenance 101. Know how to properly mix fuel. So for, you know, most gear that I run now runs 50 to 1. I think they do that because they want it to be, you know, a little less oil and, you know, junk getting out in the environment, whatever. Years ago, 40 to 1 seemed to be the common. Nowadays, it's 50 to 1. So that's like 200 milliliters to 10 liters of gas, that kind of stuff. So if you, you know, if you want to know how to do it properly, get yourself an old measuring cup or get yourself a big vet syringe. You know, obviously you don't need the needle, but the, the syringe part of it. And that'll allow you to be super specific with uh, sucking out exactly the amount of oil you need to add to the exact amount of gas you need. But that is super important. So if you've ever heard somebody say that uh, maybe you're running your gas a little too lean, that means there wasn't enough oil in there. And that means that your engine, you could, you know, prematurely wreck your engine. Simple as that. You know, it could end up scoring, can end up overheating, or it even could end up seizing because you didn't use enough oil in your mixed gas. But if you use, you might say, well, I'll just uh, err on the side of putting too much oil in there. That'll be, that'll, per, you know, solve it. That can be even worse because what ends up happening is I turned out a few years ago, I was using too rich of a mix in my backpack blower and it ended up, I couldn't get enough power. It wasn't running good. It wouldn't stay running. I had to keep adjusting the carburetor up even more. And it's because it was too rich. It ended up gumming up the carburetor and it wouldn't run properly. So I took it in. They had to rebuild the carburetor for me because I didn't have the patience to do it. So yeah, just be cognizant of making sure you hit that really well. Now, when you're mixing in the dead of winter, it tends to run a little slower. So make sure you take your time and get all that oil out of whatever the container is. And mark your gas can that has mixed gas, mark it as mixed gas and put the ratio on there as well. Because again, you don't want say a helper or a family member to put the wrong stuff in the wrong engine and cost you a lot of money. Something super simple. And in the middle of winter, every time you go to pour your mixed gas into one of your gas cans or into one of your uh, gas tanks, give it a shake first because that oil wants to settle out. And what it can end up doing is you can end up dumping off the really lean gas from the top and inadvertently wrecking your gear.
something else to think about, right? Okay, now real quick, guys, we'll kind of run through each of the small pieces, you know, uh, of small engine equipment and any of the real special considerations that we have. And that'll be just about it for the evening, I think. So first off, when you're dealing with mowers, you know, like I said, troubleshooting's troubleshooting no matter how you do it. But every piece of gear has something a little different. But make sure you clean off, and, and I'm preaching to the choir here, and it's something I don't always do as often as I should, but make sure you clean off the wet grass from underneath on top every time you use your mower. I got a good pressure washer, and I use it almost all the time to do it because nothing will shorten the life of a mower and the deck of a mower quicker than leaving all that nasty, pasty, gross, wet grass just caked in on, up underneath. Keep your blade sharp. It's way easier on the motor. It's healthier for your lawn. It's safer for you to make sure you keep your mower blade sharp. And learn how to sharpen them yourselves. If you have an angle grinder, put a grinding disc on there. And if you have yourself, uh, say, a vise or clamps, just learn how to do it. It's so easy. Also learn how to make sure they're balanced. Because an unbalanced blade, whether it's bent or you just ended up shaving a little bit too much metal off of one side, It'll end up wobbling and it can end up wrecking the shaft that the mower goes on. It ruin the whole thing. So just make sure it's balanced. How about rototillers, garden tillers? You know, um, learn how to sharpen the tines on them because if they're sharp, they're going to dig into the ground easier. They're going to make it easier on your body, make it easier, uh, you know, less passes on the garden itself. And it's going to be easier on the tiller. So just use like a bastard, a long bastard file. I always love saying that when I was a kid. And just, you know, go through a few times. Or if you're comfortable, use an angle grinder and sharpen them up. And again, wash them off immediately. Thank me for it later. Because if you don't, it ends up getting caked on, muddy, nasty, gross. Just give it a quick wash. Pressure washer. Uh, the first thing I've always learned is make sure you rinse out the soap when you're done. So if you're using soap to, say, wash something or clean something... Make sure you run enough fresh water through it to get all that soap out after. Because if you leave it in there, it's going to end up being a nasty, gummed up, kind of gross kind of thing. So rinse that through. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, Van uh, Vanderson says, Home Depot sells a cheap, sharpen, and balance set that works great. And those, uh, if this is the one I'm thinking about, it looks kind of like a, uh, it's like a pyramid that sits on top of a, a point. And it works really, oh, this one's use your drill to sharpen the blade. Those are good too. I like those. Now, I will say, if you don't have a balancer for your um, blade for your mower, you can always drive a nail on a wall, hang the blade on the nail, and just sit it right there and make sure it's balanced. That's the easiest way to do it. And there's other ways to make sure it's balanced afterwards. You know, if you feel like your blades are completely sharp on both sides, you can always take a little nick out of the blade. I don't like doing that. I like sharpening them down. If you count your strokes when you're sharpening a blade, so if you're making passes with your angle grinder, you know, just count as you go along. Do 10 on one side, 10 on the other, 10 on one side, 10 on the other. And then you should be guaranteed that it's really close to balance. Then put it on a nail on the wall. If one side goes down a little too much, concentrate on that side. Do maybe four or five passes with your grinder. Balance it again, just to make sure. Uh, now, pressure washer, like I said, make sure all the uh, soap is rinsed out of it afterwards. And then the big thing for pressure washers is don't let them freeze because it can split the motor, split the water lines, whatever. So you got two options. The one I prefer is bring the damn thing indoors in the fall before it gets cold enough to end up freezing. Now, if that's not an option, if your wife doesn't want a pressure washer in the basement all winter like mine then you can take RV antifreeze and put a container in it and pump that through and make sure that you run it until it runs completely pink, get that antifreeze inside the pumps and all the water lines, and then you can just leave it out in your storage container, your garage, wherever it sits all winter long and knowing that it's safe. So those are your two options for, you know, winterizing or dealing with a pressure washer. Uh, weed whipper. If you can, keep an extra head on hand. Those tend to be, obviously, the big wear part on a weed whipper. They tend to break, and they always tend to do it in an inopportune time. If you got a real big job ahead of you, the thing's going to break after, you know, 10-minute job, and all of a sudden it's going to, you know, fall apart, 
or what can happen is it, it didn't break, but it came apart and you lost the spring and you're like, where the hell did the spring go? You know, that kind of stuff. So keep one of those on hand, an extra one. Uh, if you're doing really long, thick grass, stop every so often and clean that junk out because what ends up happening is it gets wrapped up around the shaft and right down on the top of the head and it can end up plugging up, heating up and end up wrecking the whole assembly there. So just be careful. And then it doesn't have to be done all the time, but I pressure wash my weed whippers as well. Once again, it just keeps them clean. The, the shaft itself tends to be uh, chrome, so it doesn't rust a lot. But what ends up happening is that grass gets caked on so bad that no matter how you try to clean it off, it just won't. So give it a quick pressure wash. Uh, chainsaws. I love chainsaws. I, I could probably do a whole episode just on chainsaws, but you know, every so often, honestly, after just about every use, if you're doing uh, some heavy duty cutting, take the whole thing apart. And it's not that hard. You know, it's usually two nuts, take them off, pull the chain brake assembly off, take the chain, uh, the bar, you know, loosen it, take the bar off, take the chain off, give everything a good cleaning in there. Use your pressure or um, your air compressor to blow all the junk out. Then you can use some brake clean. Uh, Brake clean and plastic don't always get along, but, you know, if you're just spraying it on and washing it off, wiping it off, you know, a good degreaser, anything like that, just get all the sawdust, all the wood chips, all the old uh, chain oil, get it all out of there, clean it up really nice, and then reassemble the whole thing. Uh, that, honestly, is probably the key to extending the life of a chainsaw the best you can. And then keep sharp chains on it. You know, a sharp chain is a safe chain. If you don't want to learn how to sharpen them, it's okay. Buy yourself a bunch of chains. They're cheap. Have four or five of them on hand because if you've only got one sharp chain, guaranteed you're going to hit a rock as soon as you start. It's just the nature of life. you know. And then when you get two or three of them, take them into Home Depot or your local rental spot and have them sharpen them for you. Or invest in a sharpening setup. Or learn how to do it with a round file. You know, there's there's a whole bunch. I could never master that. It, it's just something I didn't do often enough. So I always just took them in and had them sharpened at the rental place. But whatever you need to do. Uh, now, hedge trimmers. You know, they're kind of similar to chainsaws and weed whippers because they're a two-stroke motor. But honestly, the only real maintenance you can do is keeping them clean. So just wash them off. The, the blades they're not always worth sharpening. Let's put it that way. A lot of times, especially if it's just a cheap electric one, you know, that you paid $39.99 for at Home Depot. I mean, if you want to sit down and sharpen them, go for it. But a lot of times the blades will last three, four, five years before they need to be sharpened. And at that point, the motor is probably no good or getting close to being no good. And it might be time to replace it. Sometimes you can buy an extra set of blades and replace them, swap them out. But... If you want to learn how to sharpen them, again, you know, a flat bastard file, something like that will work great for it, but it's not always worth the time. Just something to think about. Backpack blowers, man, there's almost nothing. There's not much I have to do for routine maintenance on those things. But one thing I have found is build yourself a nice uh, rack system for them or find somewhere safe to hang them. Because if not, they're, they've got that long nozzle that sticks out. I do like the new one I have because it'll it shrinks into itself, but they're always in the way. They're a tripping hazard, and worse than that, you're going to step on one and break something. So find somewhere somehow to get it up out of the way, so it's out of your way, and you don't wreck something that was a huge investment for you. Uh, Ride-on mowers, belts, and blades. Keep extra blades on hand. That goes for your push mowers as well, because. If you dull one up, that's fine. You can sharpen it. But if you wrap it around, you know, an old railway post or a an unknown stump that you didn't know was there, it don't matter how much work you do to it, you're never going to get it straight again. So keep yourself two extra sets of blades on hand. That's what I say. And keep yourself at least a set of belts on hand because, again, they're always going to strip and break and fray at the most inopportune times. And before you need to do it, Learn how to change them. That's why I say routine maintenance is great. Look at your exploded parts diagrams. Those are good to have, but just be comfortable with them. Know how to change those belts so that if you need to do it in a stressful emergency, you're not going to be as stressed out as you might think you would be. Uh, and figure out a way to keep the underside clean. I, I harp on that, but you know, uh, 
prevention is preparedness and just make sure you get that underside of the deck washed out once in a while those on top adapters are absolute junk i yeah they're not worth it uh thanks for dropping by van i always appreciate it have a good evening uh and last one snow blowers <laughs> so what do you need to keep on hand what do you need to deal with snow blowers first off keep some shear pins on hand secondly keep some more shear pins on hand uh, thirdly <laughs> Know how to change out the shear pins and know how to knock out a broken shear pin if it gets lodged in the um, auger shaft. Uh, and then number four, keep some more shear pins on hand and then an extra set of belts. Honestly, with snow blowers, almost every time you have an issue, it's related to shear pins. And I can never have enough shear pins on hand. And those bastards are getting expensive. They're like five bucks a pin. My snow blower takes four. I I've gotten better at not breaking them, but they do break. So just keep a bunch on hand. And again, belts. Always have belts on hand. Now, something if you never thought about, if, you know, this is a preparedness skill, it's a repairedness skill, but it's also just an all-around good life skill to have. And it's something you can turn into an entrepreneurial venture. I know a lot of people who go to dumps or on junk day, they drive around and they find old mowers. And if a mower doesn't look you know, road hard and put away wet. If it doesn't look like it's, you know, got a rusted through spot in the mower deck itself, there's a good chance that it's a fairly simple fix. So if you want to, you know, flex your intellectual muscles and your troubleshooting skills and your small engine repair skills, go around and pick up a few of them, fix them up, and then put them on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace and sell them. You're, you know, you're you're diverting junk from the landfill, you're learning a new skill, and you're putting money in your freedom fund. I love it. Plus, whenever you play that game, you know, you sit in a room and you know a bunch of people, and you think in your head, hmm, what's his post-apocalyptic skill going to be during a collapse? You're like, I wonder who this person or that person would, would they have good skill set? Who wouldn't want someone that could extend the life of small engines they that that's a great post-apocalyptic skill set to have you know it's almost better than a handyman or they go hand in hand as being a handyman but you know absolutely awesome and something else that's great about small engines if this is something you're concerned about most of them have no electronics no circuitry in them which means that if you're ever concerned about an emp or a, a cme there's a good chance that most of that shit won't be affected if anything like that ever happens. So to me, that makes it happy. Now, what that also tells me is some of this stuff might be good for post-apocalyptic transportation. I always love looking at the worst case scenario at the very end. It's always fun, you know, but uh, number one, if you, if you needed to get by and get around, if you, uh, thanks, Ken, I appreciate you dropping in, ma'am. Uh, Two-stroke, if you've ever seen these little two-stroke motor kits that you can put on a pedal bike, they're awesome. They're the best of both worlds. They just sit there and idle until you engage them, and then they kick in and go. That would be a great way to get around. Imagine everybody hear you coming, but boy, you'd be, you know, the coolest kid in town because you'd be the only one being able to travel. Or maybe you got an old ride-on mower that's absolutely destroyed, but you've been able to limp it along for the last 10 years. You built yourself a moonshine still, and you're able to run the damn thing off alcohol. So the next time you got to go into town to barter or trade, you're able to drive your ride-on tractor with a little utility trailer behind it. Anyway, <laughs> I may do an entire episode on post-apocalyptic transportation and salvage because I think it'd be a lot of fun. Just a, a fun kind of entertaining episode. But anyway, guys, like I said, I could talk about engine maintenance for uh, forever. I, I love talking about it. It's a fun skill. I think I love talking about it because it was so foreign to me when I first started my grandfather used to run an alternator generator shop, and he had the ability to repair, fix, and extend the life of just about anything he ever ran into. And I didn't for a lot of years. I was well into my 20s before I started learning how to do this kind of stuff. So no matter how old you are, if it's something that you're intimidated by, don't be. You know, you're not going to you're not going to cause a, a meltdown. You're not going to cause a fire. You're not going to kill yourself doing it. Just stretch you know, baby steps, the old, how do we eat an elephant one step at a time? So how do you expand your skills? One stretch at a time. And that's the way it goes with small engine maintenance. You know, start with changing your oil, then change your spark plugs, then learn how to rebuild a carburetor. You know, 
there's just so many things you can learn and just embrace it, be comfortable with it, allow yourself to be a little nervous and then just do it. Anyway, that is all I have tonight, guys, for small engine maintenance. It's, you know, one of my pillars of repairedness. We're going to talk about this more down the road, but it was a great episode. Thank you guys. If you want to, you know, number one, tune in next Thursday for yet another episode of repairedness. I haven't settled on the topic yet, so I won't tell you what it'll be. I got a bunch of ideas, but it'll be a surprise. So next Thursday, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, you can catch me audio only on Prepper Broadcast Network, or you can check me out for audio video on YouTube, Float, and Odyssey. And as soon as Rumble opens up to uh, live for just the basic users, I'll be over there as well. Uh, number two, if you want to join me live again this week, Sunday evening, just on the YouTube, well, it'll be YouTube Float and Odyssey, not on PBN on Sunday evening. I got an awesome interview coming up with a buddy of mine, Kerry Brown. You may have seen him before. He was part of the community member spotlight a few months back. He runs Strong Root Resources, Strong Roots Resources. He's going to be coming in, talking about leaving the rat race behind, how he turned his back on the rat race, how he made some incredible life changes and how he's embraced entrepreneurship and the freedom that comes along with it. He's a man after my own heart. You guys are going to enjoy that conversation. And finally, if you want to keep hearing top quality preparedness content, tune in tomorrow at PBN, the Prepper Broadcasting Network for The Strange Truth with Carl A.D. Brown. And if you're wondering, it's always a lively discussion centered around Christianity, preparedness, and the news stories that no one dares to touch. So anyway, guys, that's it for me. I always tell you, you know, I seriously appreciate it. You can spend your time anywhere and you choose to come and hang out with me in the workshop for an hour, a couple of times a week. So thank you. And as always, guys, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.